Great. Okay. Looks like we're getting a really good turnout. Good morning and afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today for uh, this webinar series, Backing the Middle, Conversation with Practitioners. So this is the third, the second of a third of a three-part series that is delving deeply into issues related to agri-SME finance. So if you missed the first one, which was about funding small ticket sizes, um, I encourage you to visit the either the SAFIN or the Market Links websites to listen to the recording. Emily, maybe we can put the share the link in the chat if that's available. Um, just a couple of housekeeping issues before I kick us off. So it'd be lovely to see who's in the room. So feel free to introduce yourselves in the chat. Please keep your microphones on mute so we can hear the people who are speaking. Though you can leave your video on if you like. So we will be taking questions from the audience. So you can use the uh, chat function throughout the discussion. We'll either read them out loud or call on you specifically to read the question directly when we do open up for Q&A. So until then, do please keep your uh, microphones on mute. Uh, note that this session is being recorded. So with that, I am Nadia Martinez. I'm the Senior Coordinator of the Smallholder and Agri-SME Finance and Investment Network. We're a group of organizations across the agri-SME investment landscape working together to advance inclusive finance for SMEs and smallholders in the agriculture sector. We are hosted by EFAD. Um, I'm pleased to be co-hosting today's session with our partners at MarketLinks and the Global Donor Platform for Rural Development. So I'd like to invite my colleagues, Karina and Maurizio to introduce MarketLinks and the Donor Platform. Karina, would you go first, please? Thanks, Nadia. Hi, everyone. My name is Karina. I'm the point of contact for MarketLinks. Happy to share my email with you all in the chat um, later. Um, as Nadia mentioned, uh, MarketLinks is helping co-host this webinar. Uh, we are a knowledge dissemination platform for market systems development best practices and have blogs and resources on this topic as, as well as a lot of other top, uh, relevant topics. Um, we'll also share the MarketLinks link in the chat as well. Um, over to you, Mauricio. Thank you. Mauricio, please. Thanks, uh, Nadia. This is Maurizio Navarra, coordinator of the Secretariat of the Global Donor Platform for Rural Development. The platform is a network of bilateral and multilateral donors, uh, international financial institutions and other organizations that brings together donors that believe the best way to tackle global poverty and hunger is to develop agriculture, reshape food systems and invest in rural communities. Now, within the context of today's discussion, we just released a report on unleashing the catalytic power of donor financing to achieve SDG2, which presents the findings and recommendations of the inquiry into sustainable finance in agri-food systems conducted last year by the Shamba Center for Food and Climate for the members of the Global Donor Platform for Rural Development. Now, the report's central message is that if donors and development finance institutions take higher risk with their grants and lending, every donor dollar has the potential to mobilize $4 in commercial finance. When this happens, agri-food SMEs will have more financing, domestic lenders will participate and markets will deliver affordable borrowing prices. This is the catalytic power of concessional finance, the catalytic power of donors. And with that, I give back uh, the floor to you, Nadia. Thanks. Thank you, Maurizio. Super relevant for today's discussion, actually, because we are talking as donors, as investment catalysts. So we start with the premise that by using limited resources in a catalytic manner, donors can help to mobilize additional resources, as Maurizio has just said and create a multiplier, multiplier effect that leads to greater overall impact of the investments. So we'll be exploring today how some donors are shifting from traditional grant aid to investment approaches, what some of the factors are that influence or limit those decisions, and how these donors that are here today have approached having to decide to invest in certain things over others. So I'm really grateful to our star moderator, Song Bei Li, and today's panelist, Iris Kreber, Kreb Kreber, sorry, Iris, and Bernard Zog, welcome to you all. So, Sangbei, over to you. Take it. Great. Thank you, Nadia. <clears throat> uh, my name is Songbei Li. I am the Agricultural Finance Team Lead for USAID, 
that's myself and, and two other people. I'm based in the Washington, D.C. office. And according to LinkedIn, I've been working there three years and eight months. Um, I want to say it's it's really nice to see some familiar folks online. And thanks for Clemens keeping your camera on uh, from Triple Jump. I'm, I'm happy for people um, to promote themselves during this or meet each other, network. So not only introduce yourself, but you can share links for your organizations. If people want to learn more, I think probably most likely when I attend these, it's unfortunately less what I learn, what the panelists say, and more interesting the people I met who also attended. But hopefully you'll get the benefit of both uh, during this webinar. I'll also just call out some of the early joiners I noticed. I saw Freddie and Etta from Aselli. Um, or Freda from Aselli, I think Eda is actually CSAF. So those are two activities that it would be great for people to learn more about. Uh, Sammy Letterman, a professor from GW, local. Good to see you, Sammy. Thanks for joining. And, and Wouter from Kampani, he was on the previous webinar, and I saw the link for recording there. Folks want to learn more about, about their model. So with that, um, we're going to jump right in. And we have two speakers today, Iris and Bernard. And I'm going to let them introduce themselves. And I'll start with Iris. And I'm going to ask you a little strange question about your introduction. I'd like you to talk about your previous previous position, uh, if you don't mind. Thank you very much, Songbei. And good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Um, that is that is a quite strange question he's asking me, isn't it? Um, until two weeks ago. I was the FCDO's um, head of food security, agriculture and land governance and the global policy lead on, on these matters. I have shifted. I'm still with the FCDO, but I'm now moving over to more the conflict and fragility side of things to be head of civil civility and stabilizations group operations, which um, took me exactly a day until food and agricultural investments were again on the agenda. Yeah. So that but that's for another day, perhaps. Um, I, uh, yeah, I'm handing over to Bernard, if, uh, if, if possible, Songbei, or do I hand over back to you for Bernard to introduce himself? Uh, you can, I'll take it, I'll take the baton back. I do want to dive in a little bit more about things, um, about your position, your previous position, and kind of when I think to help people kind of understand who we are, I think broadly, I think of your counterpart, if it was at USAID, would be someone senior to me. Meaning uh, at USA, their main office is in the Ronald Reagan building in DC. So we call people who are really important the sixth floor. We just say because that's where they all sit. In other words, we call it the front office. In the private sector, they just call it senior management. And so what do I mean by that? If someone at your level from USAID was speaking on an event like this, I would be the one that would be helping prepare your, your talking points. And I'm on, I'm on the technical level. And the reason I, I want to point out these um, kind of broad categories at our organizations is what role do we play? And so I'm kind of curious, in your previous position, as an example, what kind of influence would your position have on, on budgeting, for example, on which activities would receive funding or not? Thank you. Um, those were probably a dozen questions rolled into one. And um, the answer, of course, depends on the type of organization. And I'm not telling anyone a secret if I say that the UK and the UK government haven't been on quite a journey those recent years. So if you'd asked me five, six years ago, I would have probably given you a different answer than four, three, two years ago or now. Yeah. So um, and, and that probably applies maybe to a lesser extent to all organizations. I think um, there may be a bit of a culture, of organizational culture issue in there as well. The, the, the philosophy that we've grown up with was you can be a leader wherever you sit. Yeah. Um, so if the, I think it starts with, and that's what Diffid was very good at, having the capability to get into the weeds of things. So uh, basically not just do your day-to-day -day officials work, but to really, really understand very deeply what you're doing. And then uh, my first line manager always said, if you want to be a heavy hitter, understand the substance and tell the people at the top what they're missing, um, wherever you sit. So then all you need is access. And this is a little bit of a roundabout way of saying my role is one that um, has a team 
underneath her, but I also have people I need to somehow brief. And um, my, in, in our organization, my level is probably intended to be the most senior level that still has enough sight of the day-to-day -day detail and gets into the evidence to be able to, on the one hand, be briefed about the really nitty gritty, but also to be able to brief further up. Um, so therefore, I, I think the point I'm making is mostly about um, if you know what you're talking about, then you probably have very grateful recipients in those who make the decisions about the funding, if the decisions are made in your own department. If not, then you better brief the ones who are negotiating with the department that makes the financial decisions. Um, so that, that again, means um, we might be quite different. Um, can I hand it back over to you or do you have a follow-up question? No, that's fine. And when I ask these questions, you can stop anytime and I'll, and I'll just pick it back up. But it's interesting, a few things you just made me think of. I mean, yes, brief them on what they don't know or tell them what they want to hear. I think, um, you know, I think we have I've definitely seen both approaches. I mean, also the position, the way you describe it, I think is really interesting. The highest level position where you still really can see you're in touch with the actual activities. And that is really unique because I, uh, one thing I'm amazed about is, you know, the senior people have to be aware of so many things. It's incredible. And it's so hard for them to understand something besides just remembering it long enough to give a speech or a presentation about it. So I remember, um, you know, when I started wanting people on the sixth floor to understand my work better, <laughs> but then I kind of regretted it because once they really, you know, once they did start paying attention, it was just a never ending request to put bullet points and talking points into briefers. But that's another topic. Pass it on, on to you, Bernard. I think the interesting thing when you introduce yourself is that you sit Iris has moved on to a new a new position. You are in the position or on the team that focuses on private sector development. If you can tell us a little bit more about that team, your role on it, and how it relates to food and agriculture. Thank you, Sonbe. So I'm Bernard from SDC. As introduced by Sonbe, I'm a part of the what we call the economy and education team. It's part of what SDC calls the thematic cooperation, meaning we have a main role of providing internal support to our colleagues in different countries uh, or in other thematic programs um, about different topics. The topics we are uh, in charge of, if I can say so, are private sector development, financial inclusion, vocational skills development, and as a modality applicable to many, many, many topics, private sector engagement. And by private sector engagement, we mean a collaboration between a public funder like us and private actors on equal footing, sharing risk, sharing decisions, sharing steerings and co-funding. And our, our main, my, my, my main job is to support colleagues in the design, planning, implementation of, of uh, concrete activities. Even so, I'm not really traveling a lot, but remotely. Um, also extracting knowledge from our, our um, experiences and developing best practices for our institution on those topics, uh, doing capacity building, internal capacity building and um, yeah that's it in, in we do not really have a budget to implement anything except a few few innovation that we are allowed to test so I think I am in a comparable position as you uh, Sonbe I'm now concretely in relation to agriculture I have no specific relation to that, meaning my role is not agricultural focus. I'm working uh, sector agnostic, I would say, uh, but my background is agriculture. I have worked for 25, 30 days, 30 years uh, linked to or with the main focus on agriculture, food security, agriculture finance. And um, as such in our team, 
we are a small team of, let's say, three to five people. And when we provide advice, we, we share the burden and split the task according to availability, experience, profile. So I end up contributing more or supporting more colleagues that or who work on agricultural types of PSE, private and sector engagement project. Thank you. You know, I think uh, we're going to get back to this, but it's interesting. I agree we are similar roles. And we're going to be talking about an interesting example about an activity we both support, uh, USAID and SDC, the Nutritious Food Financing Facility. And as we get deeper into the weeds and actually how things work behind the scenes, you'll see how our roles were similar but also different. And so um, before we kind of move on to the next section, uh, a question I'd like to ask both of you, start with you, Bernard, is can you talk a little a bit again about your organizational structure in the context of the relationship between headquarters and your field offices. Mm -hmm. So SDC claims that we have a um, decentralized system. It means that indeed the, 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 all the allocation of funds uh, and, and designing and, and implementing of new project is at country level or in specific, I think we have five or four uh, country uh, thematic programs which are managed from from the headquarter so the people we have at head, headquarter are providing support and advice and me and, and administrative support or technical support uh, when needed but all the decisions are taken at the level of the cooperation program that we have in in 25 to 30 countries and manage from there. Great, thanks. And, and Iris, for FCDO, is, is it similar to um, STC? I think it's slightly different. I'm, for example, I'm sitting at the center and uh, the key policy teams, guidance teams all sit at the center, um, but the budgets are uh, distributed. So it's not entirely like Bernard suggested it, um, Posts have budgets, um, but the center also has budgets and not just for core funding some of the multilaterals. We also have budgets for what we call um, centrally managed programs, and they can be both um, bilateral and multilateral. So bilateral, some of you may be familiar with some of the, um, the products that came out of the knowledge and evidence section of CASA. Um, or you may, most of you will have heard of the Global Agriculture and Food Security Program, GAFSP, which sat with me in my old role. And uh, then the who takes the decisions? It's usually the one that holds the budget. So um, either it, for a CMP, it will be the directorate or department. And um, for the post, it would be at post, the senior most decision maker. And that just has, that has currently changed again um, from the ambassador to the development director. So that, that, that is now in the nitty gritty, but there is also um, there is also quite a dynamic as always, because at the, you also have, you have sometimes themes that need addressed that posts don't want to touch, but want to see addressed. So they remove it a little bit by making it a centrally managed program, or there are common themes. There's also a regional facet. Um, so that, that depends and, um, yeah, mostly we look at the needs and we also look at the top priorities of the government of the day and on how this would be done. So, for example, we have one or two um, new priorities now or re-emphasized priorities where we have relatively little capability at post. And then, of course, essentially a managed program comes in that helps post think through things, design things, or maybe they can even buy into a program if they don't want to run it themselves. So there are all kinds of dynamics underway. Yeah, I think you're raising a couple of good points. One, the last one you make is about where does the capacity sit on technical uh, technical activities? For example, DC has an ag finance team. No country mission for USAID has an ag finance team. At the same time, we are also decentralized very much like SDC. So that's where all the budget decisions are made primarily for activities that are funded, the majority of them. And that makes it difficult for finance, what we're talking about today, because finance typically is often at least um, looks for 
a more broader opportunity set, which is going to be not country specific, but regional. But I think all of our structures are very country specific. So that makes it challenging. So which is why for Selig, for example, we support it out of Washington, D.C. Um, that's a centrally managed activity. And one of the few, definitely the main one. And I think it's interesting for SDC and FCDO, it's supported at the country level. And we can even get into it more because for FCDO, I understand just from my involvement with, with the CELI is there's discussion for FCDO, there's the country level is educating headquarters about a CELI. Whereas at USAID, it's the opposite. It's the headquarters started the relationship and has been educating the missions about it. So this is just not saying there's one way it always goes, but how dynamic that relationship is and, and, and how the relationship with the activity and the funding will change over time. The last comment I wanna make on what you said, Iris, is you said the people who have the budget make the decisions, that's true. But what I wanna get into is the influence all three of us have, primarily you two, on those decision-making processes. Even if we don't pull the trigger, I know that you know, we, we have a certain amount of influence, sometimes more, sometimes less. Okay, so now we're going to kind of get into a couple broad topics. Uh, I grouped them into political economy, blended finance, and the budget process. So political economy is kind of the overall theme. We're going to look at blended finance as an example of how it, how it works within uh, the political economy. And also, uh, what part does, the, does it play for the budget allocation process? So I'm gonna start with you, Iris, because you're the reason I came up with that idea. You had spoken at an event for GDPRD and mentioned this term political economy, which was one of the first times I probably heard it. If I had heard it before, it probably went right over my head and I did have to Google it. And um, it's only after I listened to it again that I started thinking about this more and how I also could see how it was important <clears throat> only after I'd been in my job for several years. So could you explain to me what you mean by political economy and why do you think it's something important that we discuss? Thank you. Maybe I can take a step back. I joined then what was then DFID from after 10 years in Africa. And while being more on the implementing side, I often scratched my head and I wondered why if everybody professes in a meeting, they have aligned uh, objectives, then they walk away and do the exact opposite, including donors. So when I came into DFID, um, I still remember a dis discussion that was shared by the then permanent secretary, Mark Lowcock, whom many of you will know, um, who we talked about the usual technocratic debate and so on and so on, and everything was unpacked and we were in the weeds. And then he said at the end, yeah, and now in the next session, we should just look at the political economy and what incentives motivate the various stakeholders, the various organizations, the departments and the individuals in them. And then we see how we can better uh, align those so we get beyond the the nice talk to the real action and that really stuck with me and and I remember if it was a real leader in political economy analysis and politically informed um, thinking also in development and I've, I've I've always taken a look at that and in the years I've been working on um, agriculture and food security investment I've always been struck by how easily, if we don't just talk agroecology and some of the hairier subjects, how easily the policy debate agrees, but we are hopelessly stuck on some of the next steps that need taken. So for example, every G7, G20 or global donor declaration will say, we need to get more money into the areas that are most vulnerable, fragile, most food insecure, and we need to leverage the private sector to do so. And what happens? Zip. That's why um, about a year or two ago, we commissioned through CASA a piece that said, um, is this a displacement activity when donors don't enough, have enough money to put fires out when more and more are coming up in the world? Do they just look at the private sector? And having worked in the private sector before I worked in development, I always thought they, they know full well where the money sits. And in some of those geographies, the money does not sit or if it's there, it needs to be unlocked. And then if it needs to be unlocked, then we're looking at donors again. And what can donors do? Um, I think um, Nadia opened, and that, that made me think, opened um, the session by saying, um, are we seeing a shift from grant aid to investment decisions among some donors? 
and um, maybe we are maybe we're not but i would challenge us to say this is perhaps the wrong the wrong decision and the wrong the wrong mindset to do that at the moment we're flip-flopping and that's also that's a bit um political economy but it's also a little bit siloed thinking you have financial investment people and bankers who say where can i make money and if i put a bit of risk money i still need to have a return so that means you're not going to fragile you're not going to the poorest countries you're not um going into smaller investments and you're not going into high risk innovative investments um there you go um and and then then that's then they say you need grant grant isn't there the political economy is we want to be innovative we want to go into the private sector the private sector has other incentive schemes and there we are in the middle of one of the critical political economy discussions this is just uh -huh. the surface but it's going to the point of i think what we have already discussed in some previous seminars and what is really really needed is smart risk capital that helps de-risk and unlock other funding and and i don't i'm not saying we should fall into that trap of saying we go for something that has maximum leverage but we should look at the outcomes and we should agree on which find an alliance that agrees on the outcomes we want to see how we measure them and then work backwards as for, to what kinds of tools are be are needed if we then come with tools that would ideally work at the upper end of investment opportunities in halfway mature emerging markets, then we have a gap in our thinking or our incentive schemes as well. Um, but I leave it at that for now. Thank you. you you're, you're jumping ahead, but that's fine because I think these are important topics that we can even um, bring up multiple times during the webinar. One thing going back to the the earlier part of your response, you, you know, you're talking about figuring out the incentives that motivate people and all the different stakeholders. And I think there are a lot more stakeholders you listed than people usually think about. So maybe in some ways, I feel like that has been part of my job without knowing uh, how to describe it. And also, um, you know, when you're talking, what it made me think about is we're always talking, when I say we, the big W or small, um, the broader we about trying to raise more money. We need to raise more money for donors to do this work. When I kind of feel like we should stop <laughs> and try to figure out how to spend the money, you know, are we spending the money we have already effectively, right? Um, so, you know, I, I, my, my dream on a daydream is have a moratorium on new announcements for activities and just let us focus on the existing ones to make sure that, you know, we're doing the right thing and how can we improve them? But um, let me let me move on to, um, oh, I want to have follow, one follow-up question. Um, so when people ask me about activities, um, they want, they ask, they ask me about a particular activity, they say, oh, it's USAID funded. And I'm like, that gives me almost no information, right? I, I'm I, first of all, you have to tell me what activity it is that USAID is funding that is funding you or funding the activity, uh, funding someone else. And second, I need to know where the money in USAID is coming from to fund the activity that's funding the activity that you're asking me about. Otherwise, it really I have no information internally. And and I thought of that because when you also spoke at the GDPRD event, you talked about you made the point about, you know, at least about three different pots of money. Why is that important for folks to understand? Um, to support you in what you said, um, we started a few years ago to do a regular commercial agriculture portfolio review to see where UK ODA went. And that captured a lot. I don't think it captured all because there's a lot also hidden in uh, programs that is, are labeled differently and you wouldn't know until they surface in, in the OECD DAC reporting with the right label. Um, but I think, I think the question um, is one where you have different programs sitting in different parts of the business and they have different objectives and they might then come together in the same geography and do their thing under whatever label. So if you pick country X, you can have an economic development program that has a certain approach, certain incentives. You can have a humanitarian plus resilience program. You have a, can have a program that comes out of the COP debates and all three will say they do food and agriculture investment. And unless there is a really, really good strategy that informs all of them, they they might 
as our independent watchdog for the parliament said, if you're not on top of that, you might cancel each other out with the same taxpayers money, or you might even do harm. So um, th that means you, when you say you have funding from FCDO at the moment, I also think there is this risk, but we are trying to get on top of that. So for example, if you profess you want to have sustainable agriculture investment, then you have better applied the International Climate Finance um, Sector Guide to Agriculture. And for to make that happen, my former team actually wrote that one based on lots of consultation and makes it as well known and as binding as possible to minimize the risk where we have all order funded investments and they do different things and they don't add up. Yeah. So, um, but at the time, this is also something if somebody wants investment for a certain activity that probably they should be aware of. And I know it's difficult to look at an organization or a donor or agency from outside. And you always think, oh, FCDO does this, USA does that, um, the Swiss do that. But you have to get into the weeds to unpack that. If we donors were more perfect than we are, then you wouldn't have to because we would be 100% coherent. But that's moment as Songbei already described not the day-to-day -day reality yeah i think you know we're telling people what's important to know but now we have to tell them how to find that information out and i guess we have to share that or be or be more clear about it the things i tell people when they show me an rfp i say focus in on which country mission put the money in for that activity sometimes it's that simple if you see it from one particular country even though it's a regional or even you know or global activity you know the activity you propose better be in that country because they're the ones that are funding it. Um, Bernard, we're going to move on. And um, I want to follow up something that you state in your bio and, and Iris started talking about already. It says your job, wor your work is on exploring new ways for donors to shift from grant aid to investment of public funds to achieve increased development impact. So that process that happened, that shift, how much of that would you describe as a political decision versus a development decision? Well, I thought on your question when preparing this webinar, and I'm not sure I can really understand the difference between a political decision and a development decision in a governmental development institution like SDC. So for me, let's say it's a political development decision uh, as we are a public donor. But in my understanding of SDC, engaging such a shift is somehow a follow up to a political decision that the Swiss uh, International Development Corporation did make eight to 10 years ago. Uh, and that was about reinforcing the collaboration with the private sector at large to address and, and, and solve sustainable development challenges. And where, but only where and when it seems to make sense to do so, not not as a general rule and, and to shift completely how we are doing. So for me, when I said is it's a shift, it doesn't mean it's a complete shift. It's a shift of some of our resources to use them differently than we did in the past in specific contexts and geographies and, and, and when and where it makes sense. I mean, I agree. I would say the what I hear, I I work in finance. So I, I I I feel like a lot of my job is to convince people to support the work I do on finance. At the same time, I feel like it gets um uh you know, I think it's this as blended finance is as the flavor of the month. It gets too much attention or attention that's not warranted or by by folks who may not understand it or have too high expectations of what it can do. So I think going back to the point Iris was making or the idea of why engage the private sector, the, the argument you typically hear, we as donors do not have enough money by ourselves to meet the financing gap that exists. So we need to crowd in the private sector. But there's this underlying tension, what Iris was referring to, we keep saying we need to go to the hardest to place reaches, but commercial capital goes to where there are market commercial activities. So, you know, where it, they, they, how do you bridge that? How do you bridge that tension? Or how do you think about that, Bernard? 
Well, I, I, I think private capital can mean a lot, meaning there is not one single type of private capital. Of course, you can have a commercial. I don't think that uh, any we can make the effort we want. We will never attract short term commercial capital in, in, in fragile contexts and, and low income countries because the risk profile return, the risk return profile is not is not fitting the expectation of commercial capital. But we have other kind of private capital. And this is more the, 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 the private actors that are looking for a balance between what Iris said, outcome or impact and a minimal financial return. And this is typically the type of investors of private capital that we should target first. And then when it works, if it works, then, then, then we will have achieved already something important. And well, I think the gap, it's not a rumor, right? It's a, it's a fact, the gap, we have a gap to achieve the financial, the sustainable development goal, this exists. So we need to address it and play the role we can to 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 uh, fill that gap. And um, well, outside international cooperation, we know that de-risking or incentivizing private investments towards specific um, societal goals it works, right? We, we, we know that. Look, for instance, at incentive for clean energy in all our countries or maybe different uh, level, but this works. So I think the, the reasoning behind is simply let's try to attract the private capital we can in specific geographies. And definitely it will not be same private actor or private investor who will invest in Vietnam and in Burkina Faso. No. I mean that's a great point. The different and, types and, of and, capital. And we should base also. I just I, I I was happy to hear Maurizio saying in the intro, repeating. Okay, first evidence say okay, we can at least leverage one to four. One public dollar or francs or pounds, and 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 it can leverage for in private capital. This is what Mauricio said in the, in the beginning. So that's already something. I will say that it's the convergence is not private capital, it's commercial capital. But let me, I see Iris wants to respond, go ahead. Thank you. I wanted to make Bernard's response a bit more complicated. <laughs> and I'd, I'd appreciate everybody's feedback on that one. Um, you know, the UK published a new development white paper last November, and one of the top priorities we're now taking forward is localization. So you guys in USAID will say, oh, my God, you've bitten up a really difficult, um, bitten off a really difficult piece of the action. So if now if I apply this thinking to to investment behavior, so at the moment, most donors including ourselves, when we think investment, we think foreign direct investment. Now, if you, for example, look at the African continent, the bulk is domestic finance. And that, that is the one that needs unlocked. And I just heard this morning, the annual gap to achieve the SDGs on the African continent is 1.3 trillion. Um, but they also said the money is not the problem. It's the money that needs to unlock this finance, whether that's local currency finance solutions, guarantees, or, or anything else. And that's where our donor money probably doesn't go enough. And I think that's also what we're trying to unpack here. How can we make this money, Songbe, you said not more money, but spend the money better. How we can make this money do what the market won't do. Yeah. I also looked at the multilaterals again, and I thought, what do they offer? And the IDA the IDA midterm review was quite explicit about it by refer referencing the in independent expert groups report for India's G20 last year, which said um, donor money should never underwrite any investment that anywhere can get um, can get market loans. Yeah, never. And how do we make this a, a test case? And they said, um, turn it on its head. You always start with the financial return, but start with the outcome. 
the, and at, at a minimum, the financial return. It, you need three sustainabilities. You need the financial sustainability for an investment. You need the development outcome, so the socio-economic um, uh, sustainability. And you also, more, more often than not, almost always, you need the climate and environment sustainability. So can we, can we um, change the incentive schemes by putting not the financial return before the impact, but both on the same level? Back over you know, to you. A, a comment you made about, you know, yes, it's, it's the money is there. The money to unlock that money is not there. But I would even push back on that. We do not and will not have enough money to unlock that commercial capital that's needed. And so this goes to a point that I think a question that was actually raised by Mayada El Zagbi on LinkedIn. How much of our time should be spent focusing on policy? And this to me is a little bit of a I don't know, trick question. We focus on finance. Is that a separate topic for other people to do? Or is that something that we should be also thinking about ourselves? What do your, what do your top management say? I, um, we are getting there slowly. Understanding the policy and programming is basically a cycle feeding each other if, if it works well. Yeah, lessons going around. Um, and informing each other, but we also still hear you're either doing programs or you're doing policy and programs is also investments, which we think is maybe not the right mindset, but back over to you. I'll just say my quick response to that is I say, people always say, I want a transformational activity. And I say, I work in finance, not policy. So <laughs> uh, Bernard, I want to go to the example of nutritious food financing facility. Can you tell us how that's an example of what you were talking about before? Why was it uh, a, the decision you made to support, SDC made to support N3F? Well, our decision is uh, a mixed decision from our thematic team working on agri agricultural uh, and sustainable food systems and the uh, health team. They were supporting uh, uh, international platform called GAIN, Global Alliance for Improved Nutrition, since years. And, and within the program they supported, um, they had the observation, we need a new instrument to achieve our the goal of the program and the goal of GAIN at large. And the, the, the new instrument is an investment vehicle to, to promote um, nutritious food production, from local products for local markets in sub-Saharan Africa. And they did some work to, to test whether it could fly. And then they said, okay, let's test something. Let's try to build an investment vehicle for that goal. And, and, and then we were in conversation internally at SDC and we joined our budgets, meaning our section health and food system, they cannot invest in our system. They cannot. Only us from the economy and, and education team for now have a sm very small, but when I say very small, it's very, very small. We are speaking of five to 10 millions per year, not more. We are allowed to do direct investments. Let's test a joint approach. And then this is how we we decided to join N3F to analyze the possibility to invest into N3F. That was an investment vehicle that gain co-design with an impact investor and a uh, fund manager, I should say. And and uh, then we do we did our analysis of it as with any other project we would engage in. But it was, of course, a bit sp quite specific because it's an investment and it's new for us. So, so we did it, and and then we conclude, yes, let's. It's worth the the the, the it's worth to try, and we decided to invest. I, and but now because us, I it know took us, it took us eighteen months, months to go from the first ID until we were able to sign the legal agreements uh, end of last year. But this also because N3F was still in design. So it was a very first uh, step for them also, not only for us. It's not an existing fund. 
I, I'm going to have a, a specific follow up question just because I'm familiar with the process. One thing is another um, Iris mentioned when she spoke at the GDPRD event, the funding SMEs get from funds could be just based on who they know, right? How because of just the way the system is set up. It's interesting. I think in this case, the funding N3F got was like based on partially who I knew. We know uh, have a relationship with SDC because of a CELI. We both support a CELI. So when N3F was looking for money and USAID was already in, I reached out to you. So it's just this is another topic. I, I think it's you know we, we won't go into more here now, but how donors can make sure that we are looking at all the different opportunities out there versus what's often just, you know, um, could be based on relationships. And it's also just a yes or no on an individual activity versus comparing it to the opportunity set that's out there. But more specifically, I wanted to ask you about the funding because I think I got a little confused. You, your team didn't have a budget. I understand you got it from the food budget, but then you said that your team is the only one that can actually invest. So not, not exactly, meaning I said we have a very limited budget in our section. Indeed, the funds that we invest in N3F is a very small pocket of fund that we manage at our section for direct investment. When I say direct investment, meaning SDC being an investor, not being a donor to a third party that invests in our name. Okay. What we also do... So it was your own meaning, budget. That meaning you made we the also decision. have done very few experiences of providing money to a third party. For instance, we provided money to IFAD to invest in the agribusiness capital fund on their own name. So it's SDC money, Swiss money, but it's given to IFAD and IFAD invests. This, because that was from a different pool of money that could not yeah. invest directly. Yes, at the time we were not allowed to do direct investment. At the moment, since and, and when I say at the moment, since only two years, we have been allowed to test whether it made sense for STC to start using part of its budget overall to do such kind of direct investment where we can really be a specific investor in a, in specific funds and play the role of an investor. It means also shaping what the funds are or plans to do or shaping how the, the impact story they have and the impact measurements and the impact reporting and whatever. So this is a new role that we are trying to, to, to play with very uh, limited ambition more, it's, it's why I said in my bio, we are exploring innovative ways. We don't know yet whether this is the solution we should go for. And I, I have to tell you, <laughs> at SDC, uh, I, I made the calculation before, before the call, um, the total amount of money that SDC engages had engaged in 2023 in active project, meaning active program, the commitment that we had for active project. So the, the, the share of what we call private sector engagement, meaning any kind of project in which we collaborate and co-fund with private resources is 10%, is 20%. This is globally. Now, when we consider investment type of those PSEs, it's only 1%. So it means that we have less than 40, 50 millions directly or indirectly engaged in such investments. It's so very tiny amounts. And um, frankly, this is, this is an exploration. We want to learn from it. We want to see whether the one to four or one to 12 that others are, 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 are throwing around in terms of leveraging efforts. What is it in reality in, in specific situations? So we will do two or four additionals in the next coming years, and then we'll probably stop and, and, and learn from that. The, the institution will take an, a decision, an informed decision. Okay. 
Thank you, Bernard. I'm keeping an eye on the time. We have less than 10 minutes. I want to ask a couple more questions before we try to take one or two from the audience. Um, Iris, you know, when we give the kind of first laws that SEC gave to N3F, an investment fund, it seems like because it's a private sector approach, they get a pass on accountability on the um, uh, generating the impact that they say they're going to do versus 100% grant funded activity. How, how do we keep them accountable to the impact that they claim that they're going to generate? That was also something that surprised me a lot when I came to this business. Um, and I came to it from mostly smaller scale funding, non-governmental organizations where every penny is turned three times and it's much, much less and accountability requirements are sky high. And then I came to being asked about how we invest the bigger money, yeah, so financial investments. And um, well, we sign over a big chunk of money and then we ask for rather what I found were rather generic reports. And some are also defining the result ex ante. And then when you ask afterwards, then there's also this interesting um, what sometimes is, of course, used as a smokescreen, the commercial sensitivity argument that ends up leaving everyone, including the donors who want to know a little bit in the dark. So I'm, I'm glad that the donor platform wants to open this debate a little bit further where we could see more in, in the future. And um, then I, in that role, I also inherited the um, uh, responsible ownership of senior leaders in FCDO for the Global Agriculture and Food Security Program. And I thought initially, oh, another vertical fund and let's see what the private sector is doing and so on and so on. And I saw that actually the governance was such that the IFC led private sector side also had to tap into the overall results framework, which was geared towards whatever helps to deliver and in any context for SDG2. And I thought, well, that's, that's a new one. So we thought maybe we can do a lot more of that with all the IFIs. And um, then we met some resistance of them wanting to join the same framework because then all of a sudden, ooh, donors can benchmark. We don't really want that. So they are, that, that, that got us back into the political economy. But I think what we need to do is we get back. We don't need all the same, um, same results frameworks. But what we need to do is agree on the basics. What kinds of outcomes are we after? And... Uh, and, and can we then maybe also have a monitoring and evaluation component in there that goes and, and, and looks at the thing as it would with normal public sector grant programs as well? You know, I have changed my mind a little bit about this. The way I think of it now is if you're a public, if you're a company in the US, you don't want to share information, you stay private. If you want to raise capital from retail investors, you show everything, right? That's just the cost. And I used to make a distinction between grant funded programs and uh, financial uh, blended finance because, okay, they're private sector players. They they should not have the same burden of reporting because we want them to take a, 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 a private sector approach. We're giving big money, like you said. I think they should have as as, as strict requirements for reporting as the grant funded activities. The, the, the other difference, though, is that if we care about that, then we should probably fund that as well if that's an additional cost, if that's what we care about. So um, I'm gonna throw out a bunch of questions now and you don't, you can answer which ones you want. This is the last the topic, the budget allocation. It's a favorite one to discuss. There are too many activities. Why do we keep announcing more? Um, and for Bernard, similar to that, why did you support N3F, a brand new activity versus supporting something that exists already to do the same thing? And we always say we need more communication and coordination. All we end up with are more meetings and reports. So I'm gonna ask all those and then I'll have Clemens ask the one question we'll have time to get to come after they answer, because um, you get a prize for keeping your camera on the whole time. So who wants to start, Iris or Bernard, to any of those three questions? Why there are so many initiatives? I guess Bernard will be the N3F and, and how do we get past just you know, more working groups. I will not contradict you, um, because I'm I'm quite certain that we need more focused approach, coordinated approach. This is what we claim since years, not only for investment. And as Iris Iris said at the beginning, 
we we say that and then we do something else but in the specific case of n3f um to our knowledge yes there are other funds um investing in agri smes or agriculture or agriculture production there are very less investing in agriculture for local markets and there are even less uh, or not to our knowledge but we are not uh, pretending that we know everything but at the time we did our analysis we were attracted by the specific focus of the fund meaning it's not about agricultural production it's about nutrition and this is the focus and this is why we choose those this fund we if we would have uh been willing to invest in agri sme at large we might have put our money somewhere else and the diff the second the second reason is that in stc's vision if we invest our money you had a question about what expected return we have it's minus 100 percent uh so but we need to be catalytic so it's more than a catalytic role right because in in chemistry catalyst a catalysator is supposed to be intact at the end of the reaction so here we are ready to lose everything provided it achieves the impact and the leveraging okay bernard i'm gonna have to stop you there but i will say i did not realize that let's let's talk more uh, iris if you could keep your uh limit your response to maybe a minute I'm sorry for, uh, but we'll we'll try to not keep people too long after the hour. Thank you, Songbi. As Bernard said, there are horses for courses. Some funds are complementary. Some may duplicate, be duplicative. And I think this is about time to do a bit of a mapping again, because where we invest donor money and we don't want to pay up to 25% overheads on various funds that may end up doing the same. And then you have uh, very little or zero money going really to, to where it should end up at the end of the investment chain. So um, there is also an incentive scheme associated with that where those that push funds very often compete with each other. And they might compete under a different label in the same space. And I would probably look in particular to some multilateral agencies um, um, who, who would label it differently, but then start with yet another new fund. That is something that um, the Brazilian presidency of the G20 this year is trying to unpack a little bit. They have commissioned work and we're really looking forward to seeing the report on, on how these um, various initiatives and funds complement each other or, or, or not. And we very much hope that Brazil will abstain from adding yet another one. Um, thank you. That, that seems to be a prerequisite if you host an international event you have to announce a new activity, but we'll see. Uh, Clemens, can you come off mute and maybe just try to um, <laughs> ask, uh, ask your question? <laughs> Keep it short. I have to, I have to. No, uh, sorry, this is just, uh, I think was linked to something that uh, Iris, you said before. So obviously we're talking from the perspective of the donors and I was inviting you to, for once, sort of put yourself in the others on the other side and imagine that you are now a hard-nosed financial investor. And you're like, what, what message would you send to the donors to say, hey, this is the one thing that maybe you're not getting or, or, or that I would like you to do and you don't? Have you, have you got a spontaneous response to that? I think that's like stretching my mind too far, but Iris, I'll give you a shot to reply, but also this is gonna be your closing remark. Then I'll pass it to Bernard for his closing remarks and then back to Nadia to close this out. So go ahead, Iris. So maybe I can quote a um, private sector investor who wanted to consult us um, unofficially last week. And they were very interested in con uh, investing in agricultural supply chains in Cote d'Ivoire and neighboring countries. And they said, um, we don't need your advice or your support for the investment. We need you to do really nitty gritty work that helps the likes of us who want to invest in what we think is very much the right stuff in food and agriculture in the enabling climate. And they said, they said the people we have spoken to in government um, advisory services are usually talking very generically, but we have very concrete suggestions on how the enabling climate needs to change um, so we can actually do this. And can we can you knit this together? This might well be something where maybe it's just the FCDO that's not currently knitting that together well enough, but we should probably look at that where 
we as donors have two roles, not just fund the investment, but also make sure that that investment can deliver um, sustainable benefits and let's finally also financial returns. I hope that answers your question. Great response. Thanks, Iris. Thank you, Iris. And Bernard, last any last points you'd like to well, share? Well, I would simply add add to what Iris, Iris said that, um, well, when I take my experience with N3F, I think so far, the added value that we brought in the process was about refining the impact this and all the impact measurement systems and, and, and try to making sure upfront that the story seems viable in terms of impact. And then we were complementary to the, to the, uh, the fund manager and we, we relied on his expertise as investor. So um, this in, I think this is where we can combine our, our approaches and uh, being, being really more than the sum of us two. And, and I and have sorry, to say, I have to leave because I have another call. So thank bye. you, Bernard. Uh, bye, bye, everybody. Bye. I will say that Bernard, I'm so glad you're there because I was just like, give them the money, let them do what they want. We're just supporting them. But Bernard has brought the value of the donor side to the process. Back to you, Nadia. Thank you. Thank you all. This has been a really truly insightful conversation. So thanks for your openness and sharing your wisdom, Sangre. As I've said before to you, you're like a celebrity talk show host and a thought provocateur. So really enjoyed this. The rest of you, thank you. Sorry we didn't get to all your questions, but thank you for your engagement and staying with us. We'll make the recording available in the next couple of days. So uh, check our respective websites for that. And I hope that you'll join us again for the last session in the series, which will take place next month. And we'll be talking to local banks and sharing some of the lessons coming out of Aseli Africa. The date will be published shortly. Have a great rest of your day. Stay for the debrief, a couple of you here. <laughs> Thanks, Nadia. Thanks, Iris. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone.